And we are going to finish the Gospel of Matthew today. I know. We started the Gospel of Matthew on October 17th, 2021. Uh, So we've been in the Gospel of Matthew for about 16 months. Um, And I was thinking, too, you know, as we journey through the Bible together, this is probably the last time that I will teach the Gospel of Matthew before I'm too old to be your pastor. Uh, So this is it. This is like my swan song here. Uh, Really, I was kind of having a hard time this morning getting through that thing. Wow, wow. Because the next time we get to Matthew, I'll be like 80 years old. So So Matthew chapter 28, let's stand together. Uh, We made it to verse 16, the final section here of Matthew's gospel, beginning in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the Gospel of Matthew. Lord, we've enjoyed studying your life and ministry in the Gospel of Matthew over the last uh, year or so. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher today with this final section. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word today. I pray and ask, Lord, that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we come to um, some of the final instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples before his ascension back to heaven. And this passage is is commonly known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus remained on the earth for 40 days before his ascension to heaven. The Gospels record uh, 13 appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Uh, We saw last week in our study that he appeared to uh, some women the morning of the resurrection Uh, The other gospel accounts tell us that later in that day, that same day, he appeared to Peter uh, and then the two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Uh, He appeared to all of the disciples minus Thomas the night of the resurrection. Thomas wasn't there. And then a week later, the Sunday after the resurrection, he appeared to all the disciples, including Thomas. Thomas was there the next time. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that Jesus appeared to more than 500 eyewitnesses at one time. Uh, And that's just some of the appearances of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospels. Of course, there's several other appearances recorded. And the initial appearances of Jesus after the resurrection occurred in Jerusalem, where he was crucified, buried, and raised again. This appearance in our passage today occurs in the Galilee. At some point during the 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus met with his disciples in Galilee. Uh, you, You may remember the story of Peter on the shore of the Sea of Galilee when uh, Jesus restored him back to ministry, saying, Peter, do you love me? Well, then feed my sheep. And so uh, Jesus initially appears resurrected in Jerusalem and then in the Galilee and then actually back in Jerusalem and Jesus will ascend to heaven from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Now, verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, note that, the mountain, not a mountain, to the mountain 
which Jesus had appointed for them. Uh, so after the resurrection, the, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to meet with Jesus there. Remember, there are only 11 disciples at this point because Judas hung himself after he betrayed Jesus. And so they go to Galilee. Now, turn back in your Bible to chapter 26, verse 31. And this is at the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples the night of his arrest before going to Gethsemane where he's arrested. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, Jesus said to the disciples, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And so Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection, he would meet with them in Galilee. Now look over in chapter 28, verse, uh, verse 7. This is the morning of the resurrection when um, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, came to the tomb. And remember, we, we just talked about this. Uh, the angel was there sitting upon the stone. The tomb had been opened. Jesus is resurrected. And in verse 7, the angel says to the women, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so there the angel informs them to go to Galilee. Look down in verse 10. As the women are returning to the disciples to tell them the good news of the resurrection, Jesus appears to them. And in verse 10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. A and so now in our passage today, the 11 disciples, they go to Galilee. They're in the Galilee and they go to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Now, it doesn't tell us which mountain this was, but Jesus had appointed a specific mountain for the disciples to meet with him after the resurrection. Maybe it was a mountain that they often resorted to there in the Galilee. It was a mountain that was familiar to them. And so the disciples know where they're supposed to meet with Jesus after the resurrection at this appointed place. And so the disciples go to the mountain Jesus had appointed for them to meet with him. Now, Again, it doesn't tell us which mountain it is. I personally believe, it's personal opinion, uh, that it's a, it was a place called Mount Arbel there on the Galilee because most of the mountains around the Galilee are more just hills. And there's really one prominent mountain on the Galilee there, and it's Mount Arbel. I have a picture for you if you want to see the view. This is the view of Mount, from Mount Arbel. Uh, it overlooks the Sea of Galilee um, it gives you a bird's eye view of the entire Sea of Galilee. Uh, and you see the road that goes along there. That's Highway 90. That road actually follows the ancient trade route, uh, the international trade route. People traveling between Europe, Asia, and Africa would travel along that road and so Mount Arbel overlooks that trade route. And as Jesus gives the Great Commission, if he gives it from Mount Arbel, he's got this international highway below the mountain at the base of the mountain with caravans of people from all over the world passing by beneath them below the mountain. And so uh, if I were Jesus, I would I would do the Great Commission there. Um, but again, I'm just speculating. The text doesn't tell us the specific location. So if you get to heaven, you find out it was not Mount Arbel. Don't say, but Dan said, I'm just giving you my best guess. And so the 11 disciples, they show up at this mountain, wherever it was, to meet the Lord at the appointed place. And it's there. Please note this. It's there that Jesus met with his disciples at the appointed place. Now, there are three appointed places where we can meet with the Lord. 
Number one, we meet the Lord in his word. Number two, we meet the Lord in prayer. And number three, we meet the Lord in the assembly of believers, in the church. The word, prayer, and the assembly of believers, those are the places the Lord Jesus Christ has appointed for us to meet with him. In his word, as you read your Bible, Jesus comes in the volume of the book to you. He, he speaks to you from his word. You can meet with him in the word of God. In prayer, in communion with the Lord, we meet with him in prayer. In the assembly of the believers, when we gather together with other believers, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. I show up. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. And so the, the Lord has appointed places for us to meet with him in the word, in prayer, in the assembly with other believers. Those are the places where we can meet with the Lord. And just like the disciples here in our passage, the disciples chose to show up at the appointed place to meet with Jesus Christ. And we choose to show up to meet with him. We choose to be in the word each day. We choose to pray. We, we choose to gather with, with other believers in the assembly. Look at verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubt it. When they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. When we see Jesus Christ, we'll worship him. Right? One day we'll go to be with the Lord and we'll be in his presence. And when we're in his presence, we'll worship him. Now the word worshipped here, it, it means to bow down before or to prostrate yourself. And, and you would do that to bow before someone uh, or to, to, you know, to bow down to the ground before someone uh, was a way of expressing honor and reverence for that person. And it was a way of, of acknowledging that that person is superior to you. And we will worship Jesus Christ in heaven. We'll bow before him. Philippians chapter 2 says, Every knee will bow before Jesus Christ. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. We will fall down at his feet and worship him for who he is and for what he has done for us. Providing us with forgiveness of our sins and salvation through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. Jesus is worthy of all our honor, all glory, all praise. And, and one day in heaven, we will be with the other believers out of every tribe and tongue and nation and people around his throne, worshiping the Lamb of God who was slain for us, bowing before him. You know, it's interesting as we come to the end of the Gospel of Matthew uh, the Gospel of Matthew began back in Matthew chapter 2 with the wise men from the east coming and worshiping Jesus. We have come to worship the one born the king of the Jews. And here the Gospel of Matthew ends with Jesus being worshipped. And, and note with me that Jesus received their worship. He received their worship. When the disciples fell at his feet, Jesus didn't say, get up, don't, don't, don't do that, don't worship me. He received their worship. Now, why does that matter? Back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus said, you shall worship God only. Jesus said that, quoting from the Old Testament, but those are the words of Jesus. You shall worship God only. And here, Jesus receives their worship. Now, why does he receive their worship? Because he's God. He's God in, in the flesh. Look at verse 17 again. All the disciples fell at his feet and worship when they saw him, but some doubt it as they worshiped. So they're, they're all face down before him, but some of those disciples, some of the 11, they doubt it. 
as they worship. And, and some people, when they read that, they have a hard time with this, that some of the disciples doubt it. And some will read that. Oh, they doubt it. Why did they doubt? Why would the disciples doubt? Why would Matthew record that? Why would he tell us that some of the disciples doubted? They've never seen a resurrected person before. Cut him a break. He was dead for three days and now he's alive. I, I'd imagine that would be hard to wrap your mind around. That he's really alive, that he's really resurrected. And there he is. Uh, when my wife and I uh, were dating, at, at one point in our dating relationship, we had a long distance relationship. She was working in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. I was in Florida working on my tan. Not really. Uh, <laughs> I was finishing college, and one time while she was in D.C., I was in Florida, uh, she surprised me. Without me knowing, she, she drove down to Florida, and she just showed up at my house. And the doorbell rang, opened the door, and there she was standing on my front porch. And it took me a few minutes to believe it was really her. Standing there, I just talked to her the night before on the phone, and yet now here she is on my front porch. I was a little stunned, a little confused. You could say, I doubt it. It was really her. And she just came from D.C. She didn't come back from the dead. <laughs> Although I guess it depends on what your opinion of D.C. is. I, I, you know, I appreciate that Matthew tells us that some of the disciples, they doubt it because that shows us Matthew's just telling us the facts here. The fact is some some doubt it. The fact is some of them had a hard time believing Jesus was really there standing in front of them. Matthew is not editing the story to make it sound better or more believer, believable. He's just reporting the facts to us. Now look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, look what he says now, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to Jesus. All authority has been given to Jesus, all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, uh, Jesus seems to be referring to a passage back in Daniel chapter 7. You don't have to turn there necessarily. But in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, if you're taking notes, here in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of four beasts, and the four beasts represent uh, uh, kingdoms that will rule over the whole world. And the fourth kingdom, now he sees, uh, the fourth beast is the Antichrist who is to come, who will be the final uh, human ruler over all the world. And then that fourth beast then is conquered by Jesus Christ. And it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I'll read it to you. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man. That's a messianic title. It's speaking of Jesus. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So there in Daniel, he has this vision of all the kingdoms of the earth being given to the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, and all the peoples, nations, languages uh, serve him. His is an everlasting kingdom. And that seems to be what Jesus is Referring to all authority has been given to me and heaven and on the earth. Uh, in John's gospel, uh, John chapter 3, verse 35. There Jesus said, the father loves the son and has given all things 
into his hands. So everything has been given into the hands of the son, Jesus Christ. He has all authority over everything in heaven, on the earth, including us, including you and your life and me and my life. When Jesus died on the cross, he purchased us with his own shed blood. So now you, if you're a Christian here today, we as Christians, we belong to him. He purchased us. He bought us and we belong to him. Our life belongs to him. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 says, you are not your own for you were bought at a price. We belong to Jesus Christ. He has all authority over us. And please note, Jesus said all authority belongs to him. All authority without exception. He is sovereign over all. All authority has been given to him. Not 90 percent. Not 98 percent. It's 100 percent of the authority belongs to him. And he makes this statement here. And please note this. He makes this statement to establish he's in charge. He's in charge over us. He's Lord. He's king. He's master. He's sovereign. And he has all the authority over us and our life. And he is not sharing his authority with us. He's not splitting his authority over us. We are not in a partnership with Jesus Christ. We don't have joint custody with Jesus Christ over our lives where, you know, he he gets custody on Sunday mornings unless it's March Madness and then, you know, whatever. No, no, he's not splitting us between us and him, if that makes sense. He has all authority over us because he died for us and he redeemed us from sin and from death. If he didn't do that, we'd still be dead in our trespasses and sins. He purchased us. And so he has the authority. Listen, he has the authority to tell us what to do. He has the authority to tell us how we should live. Because he purchased us now. This reminds me of our Exodus study on Thursday nights. If you remember in our Exodus study, God brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai and there at Mount Sinai, God gave them his commandments. If you remember also from our Exodus study back in Exodus chapter three, God told Moses, I will bring you back to this mountain and you will worship me here. So God told Moses in advance, what mountain they would meet at, just as he does here with the disciples. He told them in advance what mountain they would meet at. And and before God gave the children of Israel his commandments, God said to them in Exodus chapter 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And God made that, that statement to establish his authority over them to command them. He is the one who redeemed them out of the house of bondage. And here, Jesus does a similar thing. Excuse me. He brings his disciples to the mountain after redeeming them, and he states to them that he has all authority over them because he has redeemed them from sin and death, and then he commands them. Then he gives his commandments to his disciples. Look at verse 19. Here's the commandments. Go, therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is what is known as the Great Commission. And please listen, please hear me. The Great Commission is a command. It's a command. Jesus has all authority over us, and he commands us to go, therefore, and make disciples. It is a command. It's called the Great Commission. 
It's not called the great suggestion. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Maybe I'll try that sometime. No, it's a commandment. It's a commission. It's not a suggestion. And please listen, please hear this. The great commission is given to all disciples of Jesus Christ. To all disciples, not not just uh, pastors or professional clergy or uh, church staff members or Christian ministries that that do discipleship. If you are a Christian here today, Jesus has commanded you to go there for and make disciples. We are all commanded to go. We're all commanded to go. No one is commanded to stay. No one is commanded to don't go. We're all commanded to go. Well, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just not really called to that. That's, that's, just, that's just not my thing. That's just not, I'm just, it's my personality. That's just not, you know, that's just, it's just not my jam. Well, if, if you're a Christian, you're called to go. You're called to go. The, the great, listen, the great commission, it's interesting how, how Christians get so hung up on, on this. The great commission is a matter of obedience. It's a matter of obedience. He, he doesn't make exceptions for like the Christians that are introverted. He, he doesn't say, well, if, if, this is, if this is your gifting, you should do this. No, he says to every Christian, I have all authority over you. And I want you to go and make disciples. It's, it's not really optional for any Christian. It's a command. If I, if I command one of my sons, go take out the trash. They better not say to me, I don't think I'm really called to take out the trash. <laughs> yeah, you are. I, I, I don't feel like that's my gifting. Mm, well, I think you can still do it, right? Now, going for you may mean going to the students at your school or going to your coworkers or, or going to the, the cashier at the grocery store. Or, or it may mean going up to someone in a parking lot and just talking to them and striking up of a conversation with them. For, for some, it's going to another part of the country or going to another part of the world. But for most of us here, for most of us here, it's just, it's, it's just going out the door. Once you walk out that door, you're in the mission field. You're called to go. Don't go right now, but go <laughs> and make disciples right here in our community. And the Great Commission is the mission of every believer. This is why you're here. This is why I'm here. This is why we're still here. I don't know if you've ever wondered that. Why, you know, like, why, if you're like, why doesn't God just take us to heaven? We're saved. Why are we still here? Why does he keep us here on the earth? We're saved, so let's just go to heaven. He keeps us here to go, therefore, and make disciples. That's why he has us here. So what are the elements of the Great Commission? It's important for us. If this is our mission, we need to know what our mission is. We need to know what we're supposed to be doing here. And so what are the what are the elements? What are the uh, what, what's involved in the Great Commission? What are we commanded to do to fulfill the Great Commission? Well, we have some of the Great Commission here in Matthew's gospel, but a couple other verses you should jot down. In addition to what's written here in Matthew 28, you should also jot down Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark 16, 15. And Luke 24, verse 47. Luke 24, verse 47. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, listen, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So preaching the gospel is also part of the great 
commission. In Luke chapter 24, verse 47, Jesus said, Repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Repentance and the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. So preaching the gospel and the need for repentance is also part of the Great Commission. And we're all commanded to go. We're all commanded to go preach the gospel to people and then invite them to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and salvation. All of us. And the word preach, it means to proclaim. It means to publish publicly or to herald. We are all commanded to just publicly proclaim the gospel message to people and to call them to repentance. We're just declaring it to people. Preaching the gospel and calling people to repentance, it, it was an essential piece of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I'll just read a couple verses for you. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, at the very beginning of his ministry, remember Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. This was announcing his mission. And he read in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim at the acceptable year of the Lord. So his mission was to preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, we've seen in Matthew's gospel, back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, the very first message that Jesus ever preached, Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first message that Jesus preached was a message of repentance. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, listen to this. Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. We are commanded to share the gospel with people, to share the good news. And really, we are commanded to continue Jesus's ministry of preaching the gospel and calling people to repentance. Right. So before he goes to heaven, he says, I've got all authority. I have authority over your life and I want you to go, therefore, and I want you to preach the gospel. I've been preaching the gospel for the last three and a half years. I'm going to ascend to heaven and now I'm passing the baton to you, Christian. Now you're going to go and all the world far beyond where I've gone, far beyond the land of Israel. You're going to go to every nation and you're going to preach the gospel to them and you're going to call them to repentance and you're going to carry the baton of my ministry from this point. OK, now, what is the gospel? Well, turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> and here in 1 Corinthians 15, we have a very clear description of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. <coughs> verse 1. Moreover, brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you. Right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Paul did that. Which also you received. That's the correct response to the gospel. You receive the gospel. In which you stand. Our standing is in the gospel. By which also you are saved. We are saved by the gospel. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, 
if you don't move away from the gospel, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the gospel message that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is these three pieces, these three components make up the gospel message, the death for our sins, the burial and the resurrection. Those three things must be present in the message for it to be the gospel. The gospel message is is that your sins, your sins that separate you from God, your sins that condemn you before a holy God were paid for on the cross by Jesus Christ. He took our punishment for us, dying for our sins. He has provided forgiveness for our sins and a way for us to be reconciled to God. And then repentance comes in. If you repent of your sins and turn to Jesus Christ by faith, your sins will be forgiven. And we are we are commanded to go and proclaim this message to people and, and just to declare it, to proclaim it, to herald it. It's not our responsibility to convince them to believe or to obey the gospel. Our responsibility is to just tell them, just declare it. And the Holy Spirit is responsible for the results. Now, Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 10, verse 7. Listen to this. Jesus to- told the disciples, Mark chapter 10, verse 7. As you go, preach the gospel. As you go. And I like that. So we've got this great commission, all of us here. We've been commissioned now to go out and preach the gospel. How do we do that? It's just as you go. Just as you go about your life, as you go to school, as you go to work tomorrow, as you go to basketball practice or play practice, or you go to the store or a restaurant, you proclaim the gospel as as you go. Just as you encounter people, engage them in conversation and bring it around to the gospel. And talk to them about Jesus Christ. And as you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that the disciples preached the gospel everywhere they went. And they called people to repentance. They told everyone about Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. This is to make you feel guilty. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. There it says, how shall they call on him for forgiveness and salvation and mercy of whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him if they've never heard of him? How will they know that their sins can be forgiven? How will they know that they can be reconciled to God? How will they know that there's a God in heaven who loves them and wants a relationship with them and wants to give them eternal life if they've never heard the gospel? And how shall they hear the gospel without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? We're sent. We've been sent into this community to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, God didn't send someone else to proclaim the gospel to people in our community. There's not someone else doing it. There's not someone else taking care of that. He's called us to do that. He sent us. And if we're not faithful to go, people will not hear the good news that their sins can be forgiven. Uh, another verse for you. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Listen to what Paul says about preaching the gospel. <clears throat> he says, For I preach the gospel. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul, Paul says, if I, if I preach the gospel, I've got nothing to boast of. It's not like I say, hey, hey, I'm out there preaching the gospel like I'm doing something exceptional. No, he says, no, necessity is laid upon me. This is a necessity that God has just laid upon me. I, did, I don't really have a choice. He gave me the great commission. He told me to go preach the gospel. I'm just doing what God told me to do. I'm just obeying his command to me to go and preach the gospel in the world. And I'm just obeying him. It's a necessity that's just been laid upon me, he says. I'm, I'm not doing anything extraordinary. I'm just walking in obedience to the Lord. And he says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Because that means I'm walking in disobedience to the Lord. Now, look at our passage again. Look at verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Mark's gospel says, go preach the gospel. Luke's gospel says, uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins should also be preached with that. And then Matthew's account says, and go baptize them. And Matthew doesn't mention preaching the gospel or preaching uh, repentance. He doesn't say anything about the gospel here. He mentions baptism. Why is that? A person who hears the gospel message and obeys the gospel message and receives Jesus Christ, repents of their sins, receives Jesus Christ, will be baptized. Baptism is the way a believer publicly identifies with Jesus Christ. And, and through baptism, they're illustrating the gospel message. They're illustrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. So baptism is a public confession. It's a public identification with the gospel message. And so if a person hears the gospel and they're converted to Jesus Christ, they'll be baptized at their first opportunity. And every believer, of course, is called to be baptized and should do so out of obedience. And so when you go into the book of Acts, we don't have time to go through the verses here, but just for example, uh, in Acts chapter 2, Peter, when he preached on Pentecost, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He was not saying that baptism remits your sins or is the way that your sins are forgiven. We're not saved by baptism. We're saved by grace through faith. But in the book of Acts, repentance and faith in Christ is preached together with a call to baptism. Baptism occurs immediately upon conversion or at the first possible opportunity. So if you're a believer here in Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, well, why not? You, you should be. And you should be baptized the next time we have a baptism. Now he goes on in verse 20, teaching them. This is also part of the Great Commission. So it's not just preaching the gospel, getting them saved, baptizing them, and then we're done. No, now there's this process of teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the Great Commission inclu includes preaching the gospel, calling people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins, calling people to saving faith in Jesus Christ, baptizing them, and then teaching people to observe all things that Jesus has commanded so, so they will know how they should live. And this is our mission as believers. This, all, all of these all of these elements are part of the Great Commission, teaching new disciples the word of God so they can know uh, what to observe and the commandments of Jesus Christ and, and how to live a life that, that pleases God, right? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, how do we know what the commandments are? 
Somebody needs to teach us. Somebody needs to take us through the word of God so that we know what the commandments mean and what they say and how we we live it out. And then verse 20, again, the end of the verse. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is with us in this. And this is the key. This is the secret sauce of the Great Commission. Jesus is with you. As you go. Out into the world. And you preach the gospel to people. And you tell them they need to repent of their sins and put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. And you tell them they need to be baptized and you you enter into this discipleship relationship where now you're you're teaching someone that's a that's a newer believer than you. What God has commanded them to do so that they can observe the things that he has his commanded. God is with us in that Jesus is with us in that if you remember uh, before his ascension to heaven. Jesus told his disciples Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. There's this power from the Holy Spirit that he gives us in Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me and Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we don't fulfill the Great Commission in our own strength. And we don't fulfill the Great Commission in our own power and our own ability. We don't make, make disciples on our own. It's a work of the Holy Spirit through us. It's not by might nor by power, but by the spirit. And, and as we go now to make disciples, the Holy Spirit empowers us and enables us to fulfill the mission. The Holy Spirit will enable you to share the gospel. I know that you are nervous about sharing the gospel. So am I when I talk to a stranger. But the Holy Spirit enables us to share the gospel with people. The Holy Spirit enables us to call people to repentance. The Holy Spirit empowers us to teach them and and disciple them. And we just have to make ourselves available. We just have to show up and go, go, therefore, and be be intentional about sharing the gospel and looking for an opportunity and and trying to steer conversations that we have towards towards Jesus Christ and towards the gospel message. We have to be intentional about that as you go about your life. Being mindful and intentional about telling people about Jesus and the good news and the forgiveness of their sins and everlasting life and calling believers to baptism and public identification with with Jesus and teaching them what the Bible says so they will know how they should live to please God. how, How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do it. But let me let me just say to you. Don't overcomplicate it. Invite somebody out for coffee. And and talk to them about the Lord. Invite somebody out for breakfast and a Bible study. Just ask, hey, you want to start getting together every Saturday morning for coffee and we'll we'll go through the Bible together. Hey, you want to you want to come over for dinner? There's some things I'd like to talk to you about. We don't have to make it this big, super complicated thing. We don't need some big program for it. You just go. And as you go, you talk to people about Jesus and you tell them about Jesus. And again, every one of us is commanded to do this, commanded by Jesus Christ. These are his last instructions to us before going back up to Heaven, heaven, every one of us is commanded to go. And if you're here today and you would say, I, I'm a Christian, but I've never shared the gospel with anybody. I've, I've never talked to someone 
about Jesus or I, I've, I've, I've never been in a, a Bible study, a discipleship Bible study where I've just come alongside a younger believer and met with them to go through the word of God together and to look at the Gospels together and the New Testament together. I, I've just I've never done anything like that. Start. <laughs> Start today. Start to obey the Lord today. This is why God still has us here. Well, what if I try to share the gospel and I fumble over my words? It's better than what you're doing now. And by the way, Jesus will be with you as you do it. So just start. It's not complicated. You don't need a plan. You don't need a program. You don't need, you know, you just, you just go and you, and you start. And, and here's what I think. Here's what I know. Because uh, as a pastor, I talk to a lot of, I talk to a lot of you guys. And, and here's, what, here's, here's what I see happening in our community from my vantage point. The fields are white for harvest right now. I cannot tell you the number of people that I have talked to in this church over the last six months or the last year when I asked them, hey, how'd you find out about it? A total stranger. I have heard so many stories recently of, well, I was at a gas station and the guy at the pump next to me struck up a conversation with me and invited me to church or uh, somebody told me they were getting new tires put on their car and the, the clerk working in the tire shop invited them to church. Another, I met a lady last Sunday who's her next door neighbor. Uh, she just moved into this apartment. Next door neighbor invited her to church. Doesn't even know his name. Just a guy who lives next door to me. Tell me about this church. I am hearing stories like that over and over and over. And people are showing up, which tells me the fields are white for harvest. People are, are looking for answers. People are looking for truth. They want to they know the truth. Well, how will they know if they don't hear? How will they believe if they don't hear? And, and I, I suggest to you that if you just start, even if you fumble, just start. Tell someone about Jesus Christ today. If you go out to lunch, you go to Costco. Pray and ask God to give you an opportunity to speak to someone today. Reach out to some, some people this week about getting together for Bible study and a discipleship relationship and just meeting together for coffee and getting into the word together and just start and see what the Lord will do. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this, this challenge, Lord, really for all of us to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And Lord, I pray that we would just Step out in faith and go and make disciples just as you have commanded us to do. And Lord, we, um, we pray, Lord, for uh, boldness by your Holy Spirit to go. We pray for divine appointments even today. Lord, as we, many of us will run errands and go out to a restaurant, Lord, that you would give us a divine appointment and that we would open our mouths and just talk. And, uh, and, and bring the conversation around to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. And we're going to close with our benediction.
Hey, if you're here today, you need prayer for anything at all. There'll be men and women down front available to pray with you as we close out this service this morning. If you're here, you've never trusted Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to encourage you to do that today. Uh, as we close out the service, just come down front, talk to somebody, receive prayer before you go. Or if you need to recommit your life to Christ because you've drifted away from him, do that today before you go. Or you just want uh, prayer for boldness as you go out into the mission field and you go there for uh, and you want prayer for that, just come down front, ask for prayer before you go from our prayer team. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you this week, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.